All right, family, we're going to begin the next lecture. We're just going to wait for the technical matter to be sorted out. As soon as I get the thumbs up, uh, we can get straight into it. Please, can I ask if this back door could be opened? I beg your pardon? I'm not wearing an... Are we good? All right. <clears throat> Welcome back to those that are online. Our apologies. There was a technical matter there. We are using a new system that just makes the whole thing a little bit more professional on, on your side and our apologies for, for that delay. Uh, family, next week is the week uh, where we will be praying and uh, well, the fast still continues, but we'll be praying in the evening as opposed to the morning. We are in the midst of a series of early morning prayer meetings at 5.30. Uh, next week, the prayer meetings are at 7 o'clock. Uh, with Pastor John away, it is my responsibility to keep things in the church going, which means that ordinarily with Pastor John here, I will continue lecturing, as you know from last year. This, this coming uh, Wednesday, I'm not going to be able to do that. It is, uh, uh, I, I would need to do the prayer meeting on Wednesday night. So I will pre-record your lecture on Monday. And it will be available from Tuesday, I would imagine, Noms. All right, so from Tuesday, you can watch next week's lecture. The following week, we back to normal. All right, so uh, please, thank you for your understanding. It's not ideal, but uh, it's, it's the reality of many different roles and functions that we have here in the church. God is a miracle-working God. He does miracles. We were looking at the miracles of Jesus. Remember the dropsy that was cured, the two men who were blind near Jericho who were healed. When he spoke to the fig tree and that fig tree, immediately the Bible says, withered from its roots, it was a miracle. The healing of the ear of Malchus, even though Jesus had been arrested in the Garden of Gethsemane, when Peter with his sword came and struck off the ear of Malchus, Jesus put it back again. Good physician to have on hand. The second drought, the draft, the second draft of fishes. Another miracle. 153 big fish were caught there. And family, there were many miracles that took place at the hands of the disciples. Philip was carried away by the Spirit. He immediately was gone. Paul strikes Elymas with blindness. Paul raises Eutychus back to life after his very long sermon. In Acts chapter 3, verse 6, at the gate called Beautiful, Peter says, Silver and gold I do not have, but what I do have I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. Family, let's just take some, a, a note of this because I think this is key. If I may just talk off script for a moment before we look at cessationism. I don't want to really get into that without firstly discussing this. The miraculous is something that comes naturally to a supernatural person. You are a supernatural person, just in case you are wondering. But there is something significant that happens when it comes to the miraculous that I'd like to quickly just touch on. And for those of you that are watching online, if, if we can go onto the live feed so that, that all the folks can can be part of the, the lecture in just in a different way. 
Let's talk about what happened when that lame beggar was healed. And in order for us to discuss that, I think it would be great if we could read the, the verse together. Of course, we read verse 6. Now, Peter and John were going up to the temple at the hour of prayer, the ninth hour. What is the ninth hour? It's three o'clock in the afternoon. The time starts counting from six o'clock in the morning. The third hour is nine o'clock. The sixth hour is 12 o'clock. The ninth hour is three o'clock. It's the Jewish form of telling time. They would say the ninth hour. And by, we know that to be three o'clock. But for the Jews, it's, it's the ninth hour. What were they going to do? They were going to go and pray. So was Peter and John all prayed up, walking on water, fire bellowing from their eyes? They were going to pray. They were going to go and rev their engines up. Right? So were, were they like supercharged? No. No. They were going to go and pray. How many of you know that before you pray, it's a little bit different, right? Than after you pray. I mean, the, out those prayer meetings, I was just talking to Wayne this morning. It's like you just, the, you just feel full after that time of prayer. It's amazing. And the way in which the congregation is praying is just like blowing me away. But let's not talk about that and get distracted. And a man, lame from birth, was being carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, that is called the beautiful gate, to ask alms. Now, that's not asking for an arm, asking for money of those entering the temple. So you can, you can imagine that this was his daily practice. And every day he would go there, and every day he would leave, and every day someone would have to carry him. It, it had to take a, a, an encounter of some kind, of a special kind, to see that man be healed. What amazes me is that people were going in and out of that temple in honor and worship of God, but no one had a solution for the alms asker, the beggar, except on this day. This day was a different day. Then... It goes on to say, seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, he asked to receive alms. He was begging. This is the kind of guy that you roll up your window when you get to that intersection. And Peter directed his gaze at him. He said, listen, look at us. As did John and said, look at us. In other words, don't get distracted, look at us. And he fixed his attention on them, expecting to receive something from them. He wanted, he was expecting money. But Peter, but, contrary to his expectation, Peter said, I have no silver and gold, but what I do have, I give to you. And here's the key of what he has. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. So what did he have? He had authority in the name of Jesus. And that's what he had. Would you agree? Because that's what he demonstrates. And he took him. Okay, so now, did, did Peter pray? He didn't pray. Many times, the miraculous doesn't happen because we are doing the wrong thing. There is a time to pray. Do you remember when Jesus in John chapter 11 was faced with Lazarus who died? Jesus prayed, didn't he? 
Who did he pray for, for the sake of the people that were there? He didn't pray because he needed to pray to get Lazarus out of the tomb. He prayed for the sake of the people that were there. I can see by the looks I'm getting that this needs to be established. In John chapter 11, the Bible says, When Jesus saw her weeping, this is verse 20 or 33, uh, he, he was deeply moved in, in his spirit and greatly troubled. And he asked, where have you laid him? And Jesus wept. And verse 30, 36, 37. Take away the stone, Martha and the sister said, Lord, by this time, there will be an odor, Jesus said to her, did I not tell you that if you believed, you would, you would see the glory of God? <coughs> so they took away the stone. Now, now watch here, verse 41. And Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, <coughs> Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me. But I said this on account of the people standing around, that they may believe that you sent me. What Jesus is saying here, Father, I'm praying to you, and I know the deal. But I'm not praying because I need your help. I'm praying that the people around me would hear, and they would believe. Jesus prayed for the sake of the onlooker. After that prayer, did Lazarus come forth? No, he didn't. When did Lazarus come forth? In verse 43, when Jesus said, Lazarus, come out. Jesus spoke to a dead man. And commanded the dead man to come out alive. Now that's what many of us are afraid to do. Because in public, are we prepared to talk to a dead man and say, come out alive? Well, we don't want to cause unnecessary Controversy. We don't want to upset the apple cart. But faith is going to upset the apple cart. The righteous are as bold as lions. That man whose eyes were healed, when I was praying for him, now listen, there were many that were praying for him, right? Right? But when I was, he, they phoned me and told me about the situation, and I prayed with them on the phone. And one of the things that I said while I'm praying, I spoke to him, and I said, you, God will heal you, and you will not have the operation. Now, when I said that, immediately in my heart I thought, oh, my word, Wayne, what have you just said? What have you just said? Because as a pastor, you don't want to cause false hope. You don't want to lead people down a wrong path. There's an integrity, but, but there's also faith. When they were testifying this morning, they said to me, Pastor Wayne, do you remember when you said that my husband will not have the operation? I said, yes, I know. I remember that very clearly. Because my heart sank after I said it. Because I'm thinking, oh Lord, you better do this. God, <laughs> it's like, Lord, what happens, what happens here? And exactly what was 
proclaimed what was said by faith is what happened. How many of you can see what I'm saying? So that when the mourners are there, mourning the death of the child, Jesus threw them out. They said, this, this little girl's not dead. They laughed at Jesus. And they said, you're crazy. She's dead. You're crazy. Faith never speaks about the situation. Faith speaks to the situation. And when faith speaks to the mountain, to the sickness, commands the sickness, faith speaks what the Bible says. So that when that thing is dead, whatever it would be, you can you can command what is dead to come out alive. You, you can speak it. And many times you will do so publicly. It's the nature of this thing. It was only when Jesus spoke to Lazarus and said, Lazarus, in, in verse 41... Lazarus, come out. That Lazarus came out. Many of us are praying for a miracle. But nothing's happening because we're not talking to the miracle. You have to command. If there is sickness in your family, you speak to that sickness. I don't know if any of you were in church that time where the one time I ministered, flash the badge. You've got to flash the badge. What does that mean? In the name of Jesus, sickness, you must go now. I command you, I exercise authority over you, go in the name of Jesus. And that sickness must go. So he says, look at us. And he took him by the right hand. There's the action of faith. And raised him up, and notice what the Bible says, and immediately his feet and ankles were made strong. When? When he was brought up. The action of faith as a result of the command of faith. And he went leaping, he stood and began to walk, and entered the temple with them, walking and leaping and praising God. And so too would you, if your entire life you've never walked. Amazing how he did that so quickly. Then they recognized him, and, and there was a big story that goes on. Then, P, uh, then Peter stands up and he addresses the crowd that assembles because of the miracle. Verse, seven, uh, verse 12. And he says, men of Israel, why do you wonder at this? Or why do you stare at us as though by our own power or piety we have made him walk? Now there's a principle there. It's not your power that causes somebody to walk that could never walk. It's the power of God. But the way we think is... God's power moves because of us, many times. Let me give you an example. If there was a, a dead person here, and, and I was ministering to you, and I said, okay, right, God can raise the dead. Now, look, in my mind, that's insensitive to go through in a funeral, right? But let's just say God speaks, and and I say, you can raise the dead. And everyone says, amen. And, and we, we've got the power and authority. Amen. And you'll be saying, amen, amen, and amen. I say, okay, Gino, come raise this man from the dead. Gino's going to say, well, hold on a moment. Um, um, you're the pastor. You do it. But why won't he do it? Because this morning he didn't pray. Oh. So you mean flowing in the miraculous is dependent upon how you make sure that you pray every morning. Now, should we be praying? Yes. Do we all pray? Yes. 
But that morning, there was, your, your, there was something that happened. The dog, the dog bit the cat and the cat was needing to go to the vet. You rush the cat off to the vet. Life happens. You couldn't pray that morning and now you're going to raise the dead. No, that's not going to happen. Not, 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 not today. Not today. We had a, a situation happen where we had a severe demonized case here in this church, in, in the old dome. And the guy was cursing and doing all kinds of things in the chapel. And I kid you not, I was in a meeting with, with the, one of the staff. They banged the door open. We need everyone's help. There's a, a severe demon case. Do you know what that other staff member who I was in a meeting with said? I can't come. I didn't pray this morning. Now, I didn't quite know what was more shocking. The fact that the door was flung open or the fact that, not that she didn't pray, but the fact that she thought that she could work the miraculous on the basis of her performance. Not, not by a nautical mile. And this is what he says. Peter says, do you think it's by our piety? Do you think it's because, you know, I'm close with Jesus and all's good? Obviously it is because we're close with Jesus, right? I mean, I realize how silly that was when I said it. But maybe because... Uh, you, you know, I heard something special or because I, I've got something special in me. No, 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 no. It's purely by faith. You can have a bad day and you can work the miraculous. You can be in a bad mood and work the miraculous as long as you believe. If your mood affects your faith, then it's not going to happen. But if there's anything that needs to be consistent is our faith. These signs, Mark 16, 17, shall follow those who believe. That's it. Do you believe? Many times I believe that God will do it because I never was faulty with somebody. I'm normally faulty, but I'm not, I wasn't faulty today. God's going to do a miracle. And so what we do is we evaluate ourselves, we measure ourselves by our own standard. And if we, in our mind, approve of what we've done, then we think that God can do the miracle. Not so. As pastors... <laughs> On the one day, I'm dealing with this intense situation. Two people are at each other. As I, during, while I'm in that, I get this message, please call so-and-so urgently. I'm dealing, and now you, you, the heart has been racing in this. We're dealing with this massive case. I put it down. I phone the person. There's a desperate need for a miracle. I've got to go out of that intense situation. I wasn't involved in the fight. They were fighting. I'm trying to mediate. Now I'm going from that tense situation, and you've got to go and heal the sick. How does that work? Faith. God does miracles instantly. Let me share some scriptures. Matthew chapter 8, verse 3. Jesus stretched out his hand and touched him, saying to the, to the leper, I will be clean. And the Bible says, and immediately his leprosy was cleansed. Immediately. Matthew 14, 31. Jesus immediately reached out his hand and took hold of him, saying to him, O you of little faith. Why did you doubt? And immediately, he was walking back on the water. Matthew 20, verse 34. And Jesus, in pity, in pity, there we go, touched their eyes. Moved by, 
by compassion, and immediately they recovered their sight and followed him. Immediately. Matthew 26, verse 53. Do you suppose that I cannot appeal to my father and he will immediately provide me with more than 12 legions, more than 80,000 angels? Immediately there could have been that supply of angels. Immediately the Holy Spirit from within drove Jesus out into the wilderness. Mark 1.31 so Jesus came and took her by the hand and lifted her up and immediately the fever left her and she served him. Immediately. And family, it just goes on and on and on. Luke 4.39, immediately she got up. John 5.53, the father knew that was the hour when Jesus had said to him, your son will live. Immediately in that hour, his son lived. And so it goes on. The, and the number of scriptures that speak about the miracle working power of God. When Jesus said, Lazarus, come forth, did Lazarus take two weeks to come out? He came out immediately. And I've been challenged by that. The, the Lord was showing me that one time. And I've kept it there. And I love to go through those scriptures again and again. Immediately, 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 immediately. All of a sudden. Now with that in mind, we do need to talk about, unfortunately, cessationism. They argue that God does not heal. They say that the miraculous gifts of the Holy Spirit are no longer in operation. And the miraculous gifts would include prophecy, healing, and tongues. The continuous, who we are, argue that miracles still operate today. And it is seemingly unfathomable that somebody would say that there would be no miracles anymore. Why would God no longer do miracles? One of the greatest uh, leaders of this thought is a gentleman by the name of Benjamin Warfield. And he wrote a book in 1918 called Counterfeit Miracles. And he said in his book that miracles no longer happen today because number one, it's the biblical argument. And he said number two, Historical proof shows that there are no miracles that take place because they disappeared out of the church. When you look at the book, 97% of his argument is actually based and focused on the historical. You can't say it's 97% Bible and 3% evidence. It's 97% proven. Or we, not proven. 97% of his book was focused on the historical element of what he was talking about. He said that God performs miracles at certain points stages in human history and essentially whenever those stages appear like for example the formation of the church God begins to do miracles the appearance of Jesus he does miracles God does not sit back passively and observe what's going on and never intervene in a situation. The freedom of the Israelites from Egypt was one of those eras of the miraculous. And so therefore God did miracles. Elijah's ministry before Ahab was another time where God deemed it fit. This was a suitable time, a suitable period in which I will do miracles. 
He pinpointed the coming of the Messiah, Jesus. The establishment of the church was the fourth reason for this. And if you talk to a cessationist, they will tell you there's seven reasons why it is that God does not do miracles today. Number one, it's the biblical point of view. You say, how could anyone appeal to the Bible as a means of showing that God no longer does miracles? The one scripture, which I have to tell you, they've all now pretty much abandoned as a scripture, is 1 Corinthians 13 verse 8. It got them into all sorts of conundrums. Love never fails. But whether there are prophecies, they will fail. Whether there are tongues, they will cease. Whether there is knowledge, it will vanish away. And what they do is they talk about the fact that prophecies will fail, tongues will cease, therefore miracles will cease. And they viewed that as talking about the fact that tongues would cease within the time period of the church. That is the incorrect interpretation of that scripture. However, they have by and large abandoned this because the hermeneutics on this, the interpretation on it was off kilt. Ephesians 2.20 is the other scripture. Having been built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. They talk about the fact that the church is on the foundation of the apostles. The apostles are no longer in existence because the foundation has already been set and the church is being built on that foundation. The foundation has already been provided. This is a mistaken point of view because the only apostles in the Bible were not the apostles of Jesus. There were other apostles that also ministered in the church so that we would distinguish between the apostles of Jesus Christ and the apostles of the church. The apostles are the foundation to the church, without any doubt. And they still, the, the, the apostles of today, although this is not really what the scriptures mean, but we can see it, the apostles of today do provide a foundation for the establishment of churches. But they no longer function, say the sensationist, because they no longer have normative authority. Now, we understand that that is true, that they no longer have normative authority. No apostle today can say, in the name of Jesus, I'm commanding you only to eat porridge in the morning. He can't do that, or she can't do that. Or to say, in the name of Jesus, I command that you would eat fish on Friday. They can't do that. They don't have that normative authority. We've already looked at this at length. So I'm not going to drill down deep here. The well has already been dug. The normative authority is found in God's word. As apostles, they look to honor and esteem the scriptures. Once their collective function is complete, say, says the cessationist, they will pass from the scene. Now, the Bible doesn't say that. That's been read into the scriptures. The Bible does say that the foundation of the church is the apostle and the prophet. But we have to look at the entire revelation of scripture. And this very statement is nowhere to be found in the scriptures. Nowhere does it ever say that the apostle has a shelf life. Nowhere. And nowhere does it ever say that the prophet has to. Their function changes. They no longer have normative authority. But, but they are still there. How do we know? And family, this is, this is so important because in, in all due respect, now I don't want to step into a, a polemic here, you know, where I get all myself worked up and I belligerent belligerently kind of garrison the point. But the irony is that the cessationist declares that their approach is a, the approach that upholds the, the scripture 
because the prophet and the apostle are the foundation and because they are the already established foundation, they are no more. As opposed to us who say, but hold on a moment. Did not the Bible say in Ephesians chapter 4 verse 11, did it not say that Jesus gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and the teachers to equip the saints for the work of the ministry? To equip the saints? Nowhere does the Bible say uh, the, the apostle and the prophet's been given, but they are no longer anymore. But now the evangelist, the shepherd, and the teacher will equip the saints. It doesn't say that. It says all five, the fivefold ministry, will equip the saints. Now, I want to ask you this evening, how long has the work of the ministry been carrying on? And how long are the saints, which is you, been working the works of the ministry? Is it not true that when Paul wrote to the church at Ephesus, the saints were being equipped for the work of the ministry? And is it not true today that the works of the ministry continue and that you, the saint, fit under us and, and are under the fivefold ministry so that you can work the works of the ministry. It's still happening today. I suppose that we would have to reconsider if the works of the ministry stopped. Then we might have some things to think about. But the work of the ministry continues. And as far as Paul is concerned, the post, the apostle, the prophet, the evangelist, the shepherd, and the teacher will equip the saints for the work of the ministry. And if we don't have all five, we're not properly equipped. Well, the apostles already done the work is the counter argument. But why doesn't the scripture say that we must exclude the prophet, the apostle and the prophet from Present equipping of the saints for the work of the ministry. How many of you can see what I'm saying? It makes perfect sense to me. Let scripture interpret scripture, the sum of God's word. Psalm 119 verse 160 is truth. In my opinion, the argument that actually the apostle and the prophet are still operating today, but under a different the same function but under a different type of ministry is critical. And for that reason, as I bring this lecture to a close, in chapter 2, did you realize that there was a very big section on the prophets? Did you realize that? When we spoke about the prophets? Did you, did you get that? Why, why did we do that? Because I knew we were going to come to this section. And you already understand that the prophet does not have normative authority. Remember when the prophet said to the, somebody else, slap me, and he didn't slap him, and a lion came and ate him because of his disobedience, because to disobey a prophet was to disobey God? Remember that in, in 1 Kings? I think it's in 1 Kings. Family, that no longer is. If a prophet today says, slap me, and you don't slap, there's no lion waiting for you, because normative authority is no longer had by the prophet. The prophet today looks and ministers in agreement with Scripture. Different purpose. We'll continue looking at this next week. Father, we thank you for this time. We ask that you bless this time, our, our, our journey home in Jesus' name. And everybody says amen. We love and appreciate you, family. Good to see you. My apologies for the the heat tonight due to load shedding and I look forward to seeing you week after next next week don't forget you will get a recorded lecture God bless you